right, well, welcome everybody who's out there on Zoom. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping things real quick for this virtual world that we're in. So order of events, uh, Michelle Raymond is gonna introduce our speakers, Amanda and Anil. Uh, Amanda and Anil will give their presentations and we're going to have a question and answer period following that. I will be moderating the Q&A uh, discussion. So uh, after the question and answer, we're gonna have an informal discussion, kind of the equivalent of the post lecture milling around that we would have if we were meeting in person perhaps enjoying some refreshment. Um, and after that, we'll wrap things up. So that's about all I've got to say and uh, turn it over to Michelle. Yeah, hi everybody out there and uh, welcome. Not sure where you all are, but near and far, but it's great that you're all able to join us for this. Uh, really, this is the debut of the virtual lecture series for Heritage Trust. Um, and one thing I'd like to say at the beginning is that, as, we, as the Trust says, in the spirit of meaningful reconciliation, for those of us who are in Nova Scotia, the Trust acknowledges that our presence is on the tr traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people in, in what is today the province of Nova Scotia. And uh, before that, uh, before circumstances changed for everybody, so that we're maybe in all kinds of places here, about a year ago, we at the Trust were in the midst of doing a a series of lectures on what we're calling the infrastructure of heritage. And that's sort of the, the underpinnings of what it takes to have a built heritage. Because before these things were heritage, they were all, all these structures that we recognize today were just old buildings. And even before they were old buildings, they were just buildings and they were all built to serve, serve a purpose, whether they were housing a family or uh, a herd of sheep or whether they were for landing fish or weaving textiles, linen and wool, all these things that took place in Nova Scotia. And other buildings were libraries or courthouses, town halls and taverns, or there were stagecoach stops. There were administrative buildings of all kinds, defensive fortifications. But for all those things to work, um, they needed some kind of support. And most of those supports were physical. They were fire protection, they were water, they were roads, they were, um, they were harbors. And so we've got all those structures left. And they were all built to last. And a lot of them have lasted and they're still with us today. And we call them historic, but some of them are especially designated as, as heritage by government. But whether they're heritage or not, just to keep on working, they need the same kinds of protections as any other building does today, whether it's been built today or 200 years ago. And one of those protections is insurance. As nowadays, it's nearly impossible for any building to be viable without insurance. It's a really old concept and it basically just involves spreading the risk of ownership of a major asset over a bunch of a bunch of different people, just as a ship might have been in the earliest days. Now it's a, it would be a building. So that's one reason that you know you can't have a mortgage if you don't have proof of insurance, for instance, today. And for many buildings, if somebody can't afford to have a mortgage or they can't afford to carry insurance on it, then that's basically a death sentence for the building, new or old. But there's been a lot of confusion that's come up over um, historic buildings versus heritage buildings, and they're not, I mean, older buildings are not inherently any more dangerous than any other. But if you're the guardian of an older building, then you know how hard it can be to find that insurance. So we're especially glad for that reason tonight. We've got two people to come and talk about this. Amanda Dean is the executive director of the, um, the Nova Scotia branch, I guess, of the Insurance Bureau of Canada. And Anil McCall is the executive director of the Insurance Brokers Association in Nova Scotia. So Amanda's going to talk first of all about the considerations in formulating, in formulating insurance coverage. And Anil is going to talk about actually the procurement, how you go about finding the right product. So I guess now we're all settled and we're inside and you know, there's one little chair for one of you and two more for another one and big chair in the middle for the rest to curl up in front of the fire. And here's Amanda. Thanks a lot. So, oops. Oh, Amanda, I think you're on mute. There we go. Um, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me here this evening to talk about uh, insurance and heritage homes. I am going to pull up a few slides uh, that I have with me um, to help guide um, my part of the conversation tonight uh, and certainly look forward to any um, questions that you may have. 
All right, can everyone see my slides? We're all good? Looks great. Yep. Great. All right, so um, just a little bit of a disclaimer that um, this presentation is a guideline only and I'm speaking um, more or less from a high level where um, in terms of what insurers look for and, uh, and how they assess uh, risk of any home and including uh, heritage properties. So just uh, before we dive right in, a little bit about Insurance Bureau of Canada. We are the National Trade Association for Home, Car and Business Insurers. Um, and, uh, and we are not a government body and we're not a regulator and insurance companies don't have to be a member of IBC, but about 90% of uh, insurers in Canada do choose to be a member of IBC. So before we dive in specifically to information about heritage properties in particular, um, I'll take a little bit of a look at uh, property insurance uh, from a very basic level, property insurance 101, which is often sometimes uh, helpful to, um, to go through as well. And there's also some additional things that you'll, you'll wanna know about uh, your heritage home. And uh, we'll walk through what a typical insurance policy includes as well. So property insurance is Basically, it's a pool of funds that insurers collect. So the premiums of the many pool together to pay for the claims of a few, those of us who, who have to, to make a claim throughout the year. No one is immune to disaster um, and insurance limits the risk of unexpected events and protects individuals. And of course, as we just heard, um, and all, we all know, those of us with a mortgage, banks and mortgage companies require proof of insurance. Uh, so, Sometimes you hear uh, about basic uh, home insurance policies or um, home insurance policies that have a bit more coverage. So a named per perils policy, that's what the industry typically refers to as a basic policy, basic poli policy coverages for things like fire, lightning, explosion, windstorm, hail. And an all risk or comprehensive home insurance policy uh, covers against pretty much all risks, except those that are specifically excluded. And in most of our home insurance policy, there's always that exclusions section that you want to take a look at just to make sure that you understand what is it excluded from that policy. Uh, typical exclusions include earthquake uh, and rodents, for example. Uh, now, homeowner insurance protects you in five key ways. So the building, uh, the actual home, if uh, your home is damaged or destroyed by a named risk or insured peril listed on your policy, then the policy will uh, provide funds to repair uh, to the policy limits, whatever that amount of money is uh, outlined in your, your policy. Oak buildings. This includes uh, detached garages, garden, garden sheds, and other structures on the property that are not attached to the dwelling. Uh, many home policies automatically include these structures to a percentage of the home's value. Contents, all of your personal property can be covered under most home policies. And personal liability, uh, the liability portion of a homeowner's policy uh, that offers some protection from lawsuits due to bodily injury or property damage for which you are liable to uh, third parties. And uh, additional living expenses. Now this piece is a, a common part of a homeowner's policy. You will obviously need another place to stay uh, if your home needs to be repaired due to an insured peril. So the ALE or additional living expenses portion uh, outlines what you're covered for in, uh, in that case. Now, in terms of, of claims, um, this is why you purchase insurance. Uh, if you do need to make a claim, again, contents, personal property, building, um, typically covered under a home insurance policy. If you see a term such as replacement cost, um, this means items will be repaired or if they can be, if they can be, or replaced with new items of the same type and quality. Now an actual cash value policy, uh, that is uh, the actual cash value of what 
the item is currently worth. So replacement costs minus depreciation. So those are two key um, definitions that, uh, that you might want to um, just check your policy for to see which one you have. Premium factors in a typical, and again, this is just, we're still just talking about a typical home insurance policy. Um, typical factors that go into the rating um, that an insurer uses to determine the premium. Uh, residence, the type, the size, the construction materials used, the location can all impact uh, rating factors. Fire protection, how close you are to fire hydrants and fire stations. Uh, your personal loss experience or history, if you've had a number of claims or not, uh, and policy and coverage chosen. So going back to some of those things that we just touched on very briefly. So heritage properties, all of what we spoke about uh, is in play for heritage properties, as well as some additional pieces of information. So what's so different? Primarily, it's the age and condition of the building and its mechanical systems. So insurers are always very interested when it comes to homes that have a, a heritage designation, um, that especially when you know, electrical systems were upgraded, when were plumbing systems upgraded or inspected, uh, roof, HVAC systems, um, again, when were they most recently updated or upgraded. Um, and certain features can add to your, your premium. So basis of claim settlement, the like kind and quality. Now this gets uh, back to kind of special historical features. So replacement cost versus reproduction cost will um, a, a, a specialized mill worker be required in order to replace certain aspects or components of your home. Now in Nova Scotia, we know that it's the exterior structure of the home that has the, the, um, the historic designation. However, uh, homeowners can ask uh, their insurers um, to insure for some of the historical components inside the home if they would like those replaced uh, as well in the event of a loss. So that's a, an important distinction to make to, to be clear with your insurance representative on what it is that you would like to be insuring, knowing that um, the exterior is, is what is needed to, uh, to maintain that historic designation. Modern building materials and workmanship versus those of the past. Again, architectural details, millwork, um, what is required to repair, repair or replace those, um, those things in the event of a loss, um, destroyed by wind or, or destroyed by fire, you name it. Um, insurers will be interested in terms of contaminants. So asbestos, is there lead paint and mold in the, in the home? Um, these are questions that they have with respect to older homes, just because there's a, potentially a higher uh, probability that those things could be found depending on the age of the home. Also, uh, bylaws and planning approvals. These are incredibly um, useful uh, because we, we know that certainly provincially it's the exterior of the home, but municipalities have the ability and many do have additional bylaws for historic homes located within their jurisdiction. So having those bylaws um, in addition to uh, information on planning approval processes, if uh, a special process would need to be taken for historic homes uh, in the event of damage uh, to uh, repair it, it's important to uh, it's important for the insurer to understand what those are so that they can properly assess uh, what they need to in order to provide uh, coverage for, for these, uh, these heritage properties. And of course, all of that leads into claim settlement costs. Um, what is it that they're estimating they would have to pay out in the event of, of a claim for one of these properties? So uh, a few steps to, um, 
to insuring your property, we always do recommend to, to shop around. Um, if one insurance broker or agent um, provides you a quote and you still have questions or would like to see a quote from someone else, by all means, shop around to find the best coverage uh, for, for you. Um, reduce your risk. So that, that uh, risk mitigation as much as you possibly can, keep accurate and complete records and photographs. That can be so important, especially uh, in the event of, of a claim and uh, document the unique characteristics of your home. So uh, things that um, should be contained within a risk prospectus. Now, this is a, a concept that um, those of you tuning in might be a bit more familiar than most homeowners, but we recommend that you put a risk prospectus together for your home, which is a document that you can share easily with your insurance representative, so your broker or agent, uh, to tell them about your heritage property. So a pr prospectus on your home uh, will enable your insurer to better assess the risk associated with the property. And these details help the insurer to make uh, an informed decision about the risk and, and quite frankly, even the coverage that you you need. So it should include photographs, dimensions, descriptions of unique features, custom materials, workmanship, history of the house, um, and importantly, det any details that you have about construction, electrical wiring, plumbing, mechanical systems, the roof, um, and when those items were most recently updated. So, um, these, uh, again, these are things that can help uh, reduce your risk uh, and also having within your risk perspective, prospectus uh, copies of local heritage bylaws. So coming back to those bylaws, uh, it'll make the process a bit smoother if you're able to provide those to your broker or agent um, when shopping around for insurance uh, as they will, um, you will likely be able to access those a bit more quickly. And we also know that some municipalities provide those to those folks who own uh, heritage homes as well. Um, any, again, information on historic designation assigned to your, your, your property and your municipality's planning requirements for heritage properties in the event of a partial or total loss will be helpful as well. Um, so some of the things that um, can um, help to reduce your property's insurance risk factors, um, ensure compliance with all relevant uh, building codes, update and or upgrade your roof, heating, um, plumbing systems, and so on. The installation of sewer backflow valves, if that's um, a possibility in that particular home, water-related claims, are something, is something that the insurance industry is seeing more and more of these days. Um, and also you can just talk to your insurance representative about things such as increasing the size of your deductible, which can reduce uh, your premium. Great. So uh, again, making a claim cost factors. These are all things that insurers, um, again, consider in the claims process, but they feed into the underwriting process as well uh, up front um, when you're you're talking to your insurance representative on uh, on obtaining insurance. Making a claim, uh, what to expect? So replacement cost includes debris removal, and some folks often ask why they're insured for more than perhaps the market value of their home. This is a big one because in the event of a total loss, uh, the insurer would be required to remove the debris from um, the, the, the location in addition to um, restoring the property, restoring the foundation in order to rebuild it. And then you have construction costs, design and architecture services, and then we're, we're back to market value versus uh, replacement costs. So uh, things that all, um, feed into, um, feed into the, the process. So, and again, uh, additional living expenses. Um, this is another piece that you may wanna take a look at on your uh, insurance policy and depending on um, the intricate or specialized uh, woodwork or, or things that would have to be perhaps ordered in from elsewhere that might take a bit longer to arrive and then, um, construction could begin. 
you might want to take a look at this just to understand what your additional living costs are um, in the event of uh, of a loss. Just how long your insurer will will um, will pay to ensure that uh, you're comfortable elsewhere while your your house is being put back together. And finally, uh, this is just how to get a hold of us. If you have any further questions, we do have a consumer information center uh, that does operate through through business hours, and we are very happy to uh, to take uh, your questions and have one-on-one -on -one conversations in terms of your particular situation, your particular home um, through this uh, this call center. And with that, thank you so much. Looking forward to the questions later. Great, I'm up, am I? Yes, indeed. Perfect. Okay, so let's get this started. Um, so first of all, I uh, just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, Michelle and, and Gabrielle for uh, inviting IBANS and myself to, uh, to talk tonight. Uh, Michelle actually reached out to me uh, about a year ago, or, or actually it was pre-COVID, so I guess it was probably more, more than a year ago now. Um, looking for some uh, some resources and some help with uh, some of the insurance challenges that uh, that uh, your, your members have been having um, through the past year and in, in our discussions, um, uh, Michelle and I have have come to to realize that uh, our association is is probably not best to address some of the more intricate uh, questions that you have. But what I felt that we could do is uh, is I could provide. Um, some guidance and um, some information around the actual insurance purchasing process um, and hopefully help guide you in, um, uh, in understanding how, how the product is, is purchased and, and what you can do best to put yourself in, in a situation to get the right coverage um, at the right price. So first of all, a little bit about our association, uh, the Insurance Brokers Association of Nova Scotia or IBANS, as you may hear me uh, refer to it as, uh, is a, um, a nonprofit voluntary member association representing 1,100 insurance brokers across the province. Um, our association was formed in 1949 and um, uh, you know, obviously is still active today. Um, we are part of a larger national association called the Insurance Brokers Association of Canada. Um, our primary role is to act as a resource to, um, to government and to other um, agencies within the insurance industry to promote the role that brokers play in their communities and to advocate on behalf of brokers and uh, brokers' clients. Uh, we're not necessarily a, uh, a consumer-facing organization. However, we do have resources that, um, that may point you in the right direction if you're having challenges with your insurance. Um, you can certainly reach out and uh, we may be able to point you in the right direction. So the first thing I wanted to talk about tonight is um, really how you buy property insurance in Nova Scotia. Uh, this may be um, repetitive to, for some of you, but um, I, I found in, in my career that there's quite a bit of confusion around um, who you're buying insurance from, how it's being purchased, um, and what the options are. Essentially, in Nova Scotia, you've got two ways of purchasing insurance. So whether you're buying insurance on the phone, whether you're buying insurance face-to-face, uh, -face, or whether you're buying insurance on the, uh, on the internet, you're essentially buying from in two different ways. The first way is what we call the direct channel. So you're going to be purchasing insurance direct from the insurance company. In this uh, scenario, the agent from the insurance company is selling you a product on behalf of their company, and you're buying a product directly from the insurer from their grouping of products. The second option is to purchase through what we will call the broker channel. In this scenario, the broker is gonna act on your behalf arranging insurance. The broker has access to multiple markets with a variety of coverages. The broker is going to be able to provide you with multiple options and hopefully be able to negotiate a preferred rate with the insurer for you. And the broker has a responsibility to look after your interests. Insurance brokers are going to offer you a wide choice of products and price comparisons from a number of insurance companies and give you advice on your specific risks and suitable insurance protection. The broker should be providing you with clear information and explaining policy details and will be there to support you and represent you if you need to make a claim. Next, I want to talk a little bit about how a broker is going to secure coverage for you. 
So when you call up a brokerage and say, uh, you know, I want to insure my home, can you please give me a price? The broker is essentially going to have three different ways that they're ultimately going to find the end product for you. The first one is through agreements that the broker is going to have with carriers. So each brokerage is going to have their own agreements with carriers, which will allow them to bind or place coverage at any given time. This is going to allow the broker to quickly secure pricing in terms for, your, for a client, and the majority of policies are going to be placed this way. So in the scenario, you're calling up the broker. You're saying, again, Mr. Broker, I need a, a price for my home. The broker is going to quickly be able to determine that your home fits within the guidelines, that they're allowed to place coverage for one or more insurance companies, and very able or very quickly able to turn around and give you a price and terms for your property. The second option that the broker is going to have is to seek out alternative solutions. So in certain scenarios, a broker may not be able to quickly give you a price on your property. For whatever reason, your property may not fit into um, the set conditions that the broker has to place coverage with their carriers. In this scenario, the broker is going to have to search out from specialty insurers on an individual basis. This, mean, this means the broker is approaching insurers for your specific policy to get specific pricing in specific terms. This is going to be a extended process. This isn't going to be a, um, a scenario where the broker can provide a quote within you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, half hour, an hour. This is probably going to take the broker three to five days. So anytime you, you have a broker that says, thank you for giving me the opportunity to quote your property, it's going to take me a few days or it's going to take me a week or two weeks in order to get the best terms for you. This is probably what's going on. The broker has got to search out the marketplace Make sure they can find you the best pricing and the adequate coverage for your property. There isn't anything inherently bad about this option. It's just a different option that the broker has got to go through in order to secure coverage for you. The third option that you may see, which is probably going to be significantly less often, and you'll probably only see it with larger properties with uh, significantly higher property values or um, uh, possibly complex commercial properties, is where the broker is actually going to put together the policy for you on behalf of multiple insurance companies. So in this scenario, the broker is going to go to an insurance company and say, can you give me terms on this property? The insurer might say, yes, we love, we would love to insure this property, but we only have the ability to insure 10% of it or 20% of it or 40% of it or whatever the percentage is. The broker is then going to have to seek out other insurers and put together a policy for you this so that they can insure your entire structure. This is going to involve the broker negotiating with multiple insurers in order to create a specific policy for your specific risk. Again, this process is going to take um, longer than just an afternoon or just a day. This is going to take the broker uh, several days, possibly several weeks. Um, it could even be a couple months in a, in a more complex scenario. Some suggestions for securing coverage. Um, Amanda already touched on um, really a few of them, um, but from my perspective, um, some of the ways that you can put yourself in the best possible situation to secure coverage at a, at a reasonable rate. Uh, the first and foremost in, in your scenario uh, would be to shop local. Um, uh, while as an association, we can't uh, recommend one broker over another, um, I would suggest that a local broker is going to understand the unique characteristics of your region and of your property, um, particularly um, with, with heritage properties and, and, and older properties. The broker may be familiar with the building and be able to advocate on your behalf. Um, this is really, in my opinion, invaluable when the broker is having that negotiation process with the carrier. If the broker knows your building, if they understand your building, if they grew up with your building or, or walk by your building every single day, um, it really puts them in a much stronger position to uh, work with the insurer to make sure that you are getting the best possible pricing and the best possible coverage. Um, the reality is um, uh, sometimes what the insurer is seeing on paper may not necessarily match what you know to be true about the building and what the broker knows to be true about the building. And so if you can find a broker that, um, that is local and, and understands your area, um, you're, you're putting yourself in a, in a better position. The second tip, uh, Amanda really touched on it there with the risk uh, perspectives. I, I can't tell you how valuable that is. Um, 
uh, photos, information on updates to your property, the current occupancy of the property, uh, and the history of the property are extremely important. Um, again, you want to put your broker and the insurance company in the best possible situation to understand the property. Um, you know the building inside and out. Um, we, we, you know, you want to put the broker in that situation where they know the building inside and out as well. Um, and so continually documenting information anytime you do updates to your building, anytime you have someone come in and, and you know, fix some plumbing or update some plumbing, update some electrical, document, 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 keep that risk prospectus, have that on hand so that um, you can arm your broker with the best possible information to get you uh, uh, terms that, um, that properly insure your property. And then the third tip I would say is, is provide time. Um, we live in a world where uh, we naturally kind of expect things to happen fairly quickly. Um, this is true of insurance. And in, in many situations, insurance can be acquired very quickly, very easily. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, heritage, uh, older and more complex properties are going to require a little bit more time to secure coverage due to their unique nature. Um, brokers are um, daily dealing with many of many buildings that are the same. And then when you run into a building that's a little bit different, um, it, it, it takes them a little bit longer to understand what that building is, where the best insurance company is to go for it, um, how to best insure that property. So my suggestion, again, is really to provide time, work with your broker agent and provide time for them to approach multiple markets and find the best coverage. Um, again, there are scenarios where the broker may have to search out, seek out, five, 10, 15 different companies in order to find you the coverage that's best for your property. And, you know, that is a situation that is, that's really just going to take time. Lastly, I uh, just want to touch on um, uh, the, the idea around shopping local and, and shopping from a broker. Uh, again, I don't want to uh, sound like I'm, I'm trying to market uh, anything here, but uh, again, I, I do believe that your best option is to buy from a broker. Um, brokers are local across our uh, province. Um, chances are whatever community you're calling in from today, you've got multiple brokers uh, within a stone's throw that, um, as Amanda suggested, if you're not happy with one, um, call another one. Um, different brokers do have different carriers that they work with. Um, they have access to different marketplaces. They have different levels of experience. They have different abilities to um, uh, negotiate uh, a rate. So um, my suggestion, if you're not happy with your pricing, if you're not happy with the service that the broker is giving you, um, you know, uh, pick up the phone, call another broker and, and, and ask them to, to get to work for you. Um, if you are looking to find a broker, uh, you'll see that uh, often we are represented by this logo, which we call the, the Bipper, uh, this little man here, um, which should be displayed prominently on, uh, on any broker's um, website or, uh, or storefront. So with that said, I will thank, uh, thank everyone for their time and uh, turn it back over to uh, Gabrielle for the uh, question and answer. Great, thank you so much, Emil. Um... Um, yeah, Michelle might want to get things started with a couple questions um, and just yeah, okay. while I'm, I'm waiting for others to write into me and just a reminder um, to our listeners um, that our speakers can't answer uh, questions about specific situations, but um, please, please send all other kinds of questions in to me. Thank you. Look, both of you, that's, that's great. And thank you. Um, Something that I wondered about, I mean, you keep hearing about the difficult, the, you know, the challenges and the, spe the specialized um, nature of these. Now, are there any brokers or companies here um, who have expertise in this? And if not, would it make sense for a group of prop heritage property owners to, um, to approach a broker or a company jointly and say, you know, we've all got these kind of shared challenges and would you be interested in quoting on a group of properties or does that make any sense? Sure, I can start and Neil, if you wanna jump in. Um, yeah, the heritage properties are so specific uh, because each home has such a rich story. 
And sometimes it does take a little bit longer, coming back to Anil's presentation about how some brokers can bind or um, which means provide a, a quote and underwriting for um, a property relatively quickly. Typically in a heritage home situation after the broker enters in that initial information, the screen will pop up and say, refer to bind, which basically means the broker needs to have a conversation with the underwriter on the phone um, just to get that process started with that specific information. In terms of a, a group buy for heritage homes, um, you know, you could certainly certainly try. With insurers and brokers, um, they like to diver diversify their risk. So uh, an awful lot of one kind of risk may not be something that uh, would be more cost effective through one broker or, or one insurer. Sure. So caution there. Okay. And um, one more, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, Michelle, to your point, you, you know, you asked about uh, approaching or, or what insurers will insure, you know, these properties or, or how to do that. Um, I can't really answer that. But what I, what I can say is that insurers are uh, constantly and more rapidly in the last, particularly the last couple of years, changing what they're, they're interested in. Um, insurers are changing the models around what they use to um, uh, uh, assess risk and to uh, predict losses. And this is causing a shift in, in what we would call an appetite for insurers as far as what they'll insure. Mm -hmm. And so what is true today may not be true um, you know, a year from now or two years from now. And so this is really why I know it's, it's kind of like beating a, you know, beating a dead horse, uh, pardon the expression, um, to say shop around. But the reason is because, you know, appetites do change, interest in insuring things do change. Uh, insurers will react to information that comes available um, and may determine where in the past they said, hey, we, we're not interested in insuring this type of property or, or these types of properties may a year from now say, hey, well, you know what, we were wrong. We, we should have been insuring those properties. Those, those are attractive to us. So, you know, let, let's open up the appetite for that. Um, and so that's why it is difficult to answer the question around, um, you know, what insurers will insure, you know, anything at any given time, because as I say, it is a changing, uh, unfortunately, it's a bit of a moving goalpost. It, it will change over time. Okay. Well, thank you anyway. Yeah. No, we'll, I'm sure the buildings will be around for ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Gabriella. Yeah, um, I have a question from John Blackwell. Um, wondering if you guys would like to comment on the difference between insuring commercial versus residential heritage buildings. That's that's a great question, uh, and it's uh, a completely different product from an insurance perspective. Uh, because once you enter into the commercial sphere, you're dealing with commercial insurance products. Those can be tailored based on the, um, the business owner. So the business owner might say, well, I'm going to self-insure up to $200,000 and then I just want basically a policy in excess um, and a, a commercial general liability policy. Uh, whereas with a home insurance policy, it's a bit more pres prescriptive. You're insuring uh, the home against certain perils. You're, you are um, getting the liability coverage and, and additional living expenses, all of those things that I touched on, I think the, the five categories in, uh, in my presentation. So it's a, a very different, um, very different product. Commercial insurance in and of itself is um, an entirely different and in some ways complex and, uh, and heritage uh, buildings are, are complex. So it might take a little bit longer um, to get all of the right information collected and in front of the insurance representative for that particular piece. Yeah, and, and I'll just echo what, what Amanda said. Um, the commercial policies are, are going to be much more tailored, much more uh, uh, specific to a particular risk. So um, it's 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 just a different world than the the residential. Uh, residential is, is tend to going to tend to be more streamlined, packaged policies. Um, and that's why at times there's, there may be a little more flexibility in the commercial market. Um, you generally are going to pay a little bit more. And as I say, there's going to be coverages uh, missing. If you're moving, if, you know, if you're looking at your homeowner's policy and then looking at a commercial policy, there's, there's going to be things that are not going to match up because the, the homeowner's policy is, is designed to be more comprehensive and to um, just in its nature include um, more things than the, the, uh, any 
individual commercial policy will. Lovely, thank you. Um, I've also got another question that's come in. Um, do you know if anyone's compiled a list of insurance companies that will insure heritage buildings in the Maritimes or maybe even just in Nova Scotia? I know that's a resource that many of our members would be interested in. Uh, no, there, there hasn't been uh, such a list. And for a lot of the reasons that Neil touched on, there probably won't be uh, such a list that you can find easily. Uh, just going through your insurance representative, actually, um, I was quite thrilled well, two days ago, uh, our consumer information line had a, had a call come in. And sometimes I like to pick those up because I learned something uh, about the process. Um, and it was actually a question about a heritage property in particular. And um, oddly enough, uh, the individual told me that there were uh, two specific companies that weren't insuring heritage properties any longer. Um, sure enough, I called both of those companies, um, did some investigation, and that's not the case. They are still insuring heritage properties. Uh, so again, they reconfirmed that underwriting looks at the age of the building. And then if there's a heritage designation, they need to have um, those municipal bylaws. So getting that information in the hands of your, your broker or agent um, will enable that process to go forward. So there might be times when um, folks are calling and looking for a quote on, on heritage properties and don't necessarily have all of that information at the ready. Um, that that's when the insurance reps come back and say, look, we need more information. We need, um, we need you to help us compile all of this because these uh, brokers, agents, and, and insurers, they don't have access as easily to this information as, uh, as the homeowner would. So, so incredibly important to get that all piled together. We, we could, Gabrielle, I mean, you know, I, I could try, we could try to get an up-to-date list. Again, it, it's challenging because heritage, to say heritage properties is a broad, you know, it's a broad stroke thing that uh, there may be other factors that are that are preventing an insurer from insuring any particular property. Um, but I can certainly take that as a takeaway and, and we can try as an association to, to get some answers there. Uh, but again, understand that these things are, are just such a moving target right now. Um, it really is, um, insurers are changing their appetites um, very frequently. And um, what's true today may not be true a month from now or, or six months from now. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, kind of to the point uh, about compiling the right information and making sure the right people get complete information. Um, I have a question here about, do you know, are there any samples of the risk perspective that you talked about, like a sample that somebody could, you know, looking to make one maybe for the first time could look at and, and base their work on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't have one at my fingertips. I can certainly uh, see if I can uh, locate one and, and share that with the group. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, no, I was going to suggest that maybe if anybody has any other questions that maybe we can um, uh, sort of break up into the tea and cookies as Gabrielle suggested, um, but also kind of if everybody wants to put on their photos, their, their screens and try to talk that way, but also, um, if you, uh, if we can provide your contact information and Amanda, if you, if you're able to find a copy of or a, a suggestion for a risk perspective, I think that would be really helpful. I'm almost thinking that something that we at the trust could do is sort of say, declare an annual heritage update day. So everybody, you know, just, just like checking your, your smoke alarms, you know, when the daylight savings time changes that just have a day when it says, okay, everybody make sure your risk prospectus is up to date and that sort of thing. But it's, so that, that really would be, hmm? that would be great. That would be great, Michelle, just speaking again, for, I, you know, I can't stress enough speaking from the, the broker's perspective okay. like, to have, to have something that's updated, you know, not just once, but consistently updated goes yeah. just would go so far. Really? Okay. I mean, you both stressed that. So if you, I mean, if anyone has an example of uh, risk perspectives, that might be something that we can share um, perhaps even on the way on the trust website. 
Um, but look, thank you both so very much. This is just so helpful. Um, yeah, and I, I hope we'll have a chance to continue the conversations one way or the other. Absolutely. That's an awful lot. I appreciated this. Okay, take care. And thank Gabrielle, you. thank you. Okay. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs>